we've seen a lot of things. We've seen music, which is not something that you don't often see at a TEDx. It's kind of interesting. We've seen math. And we've actually even seen a little bit of the medical field. And now you've got a student standing in front of you with a gigantic picture of his neighbor's wheel and a tired cliche. First off, I'd like to point out I'm not a big fan of cliches myself. And I fully understand if you're rolling your eyes at me right now. But I think the image that I'm trying to make, the correlation that comes from this, makes a little bit of sense. So the first thing that I'd like to point out about this wheel is there's many wheels incorporated within it. The first thing is it's going to interact with an axle that allows it to actually move the vehicle it works with. But it doesn't do that without the rubber that surrounds it around the other wheel that allows it to impart the friction to the road, effectively moving that vehicle forward. Now, as a scientific people, the idea of not reinventing the wheel is kind of ridiculous, if you think about it. It's kind of the same idea as saying, that's good enough. And if, unlike Debbie Fields, we had decided to say that good enough, in fact, is good enough, just think about how hard it would have been just to get here today. 27th is kind of a steep hill. Now just imagine in the brand new 2016 Fred Flintstone classic, walking up that hill with two large cylinders of stone. That's pretty heavy. And quite frankly, I don't think we'd be even there. To tell you the truth, the original wheel was mostly round and was pushed across rendered animal fat in order to make it across the ground. Now imagine bringing all of this equipment here today with that kind of method. We wouldn't even really be there. In order to create that equipment, we need tools like this. The saw itself is many, in fact, wheels put together. The blade itself is a wheel. It's attached to the saw by another wheel, and there's wheels in the form of gears inside of it that allow it to interact with the motor. Without this, we could not build a lot of the things this stage in the way that we have today. Now, you might ask yourself, after this student told me, I'm not a big fan of cliches, why are you standing up here for minutes on end telling me about the wheel and why it's important that we reinvent it? So this kind of comes to where the correlation comes from. The mental health field has been progressing very quickly with the scientific field as well. The field of pharmaceuticals and neurology has been growing immensely. However, for addiction problems, there is no such thing as that miracle cure pill. I know we've probably all seen it at 2 in the morning while we're watching South Park or the Gem Channel, whatever it is you like. But in fact, there is no real pill that does this. So the traditional treatment the traditional face-to-face -face treatment is where we end up. So we need to talk a little bit about where they run into problems with that traditional treatment and what we need to do to fix it. The first problem that we're going to run into is the fact that clinicians are overtaxed. I spoke with some clinicians that I've met with recently that told me that the individual therapist, and this is the person that meets with somebody at least once a week for an hour at a time, and then has to build an individually tailored case for that person to help them, this person meets at least 1 to 20 people a week. Now, at an hour a time just for that meeting, that's 20 hours a week. Then you have the arduous task of putting together an individual program. Now, we can see that at this point, at 1 to 20, we're probably going to have a little bit of overtime involved. But this is actually just a short number. It's been expressed that 1 to 30 is what our actual goal is in this relationship. So we move on to somebody that actually deals with full cases, the people who arrange meetings with these therapists, the people who actually allow the client to grow and don't really have the ability to work for themselves. So that case manager has to pull in there and help them work with the courts. So this person deals with up to 60 families at a time. Now, if you think about it, families involve more than one people, obviously, or more than one person, my apologies. So if you think about it, this person individually tools programs for every single person in this family in order to better their lives. This person, obviously, themselves is going to be working a lot of time to do so. Next, we talk about neuropsychological evaluations. Now, you see here a number of 1 to 60. Now, I can almost see above your heads an image of people standing in line 
in front of an MRI machine waiting to get the brain scanned. Now this is not what a neuropsychological evaluation looks like. Originally, yes, we did some research that involved this kind of work, but a neuropsychological evaluation is an interview that takes up to three hours at a time. Now if you imagine a three-hour interview for 60 people at a time, this person actually really very rarely gets the chance to leave the clinic. Now, I know that it's important that we understand where the clinicians have their walls and their barriers to break through, but the most important person in this situation is obviously the client. And in order to understand what we can do to break the cycle for these clients, we have to understand the cycle. And the first thing we have to understand is why exactly this isn't working, my apologies. Why and what causes addiction? Now first off, we all know a little bit about Mendelian genetics. We all went to middle school, we understand that our hair color, our eye color, our height, a lot of our phenotype is given to us graciously by our parents. Now, a lot of people don't really associate this though with mental facilities. We do see, however, that through adoption studies, and through actual twin studies where the twins have been separated from each other at birth, that there is a genetic influence in addiction. And it does actually make an influence on the way your life comes out. So we do see that genetic influence. Now I'd like you all to put yourself back in your shoes. 10 years ago, 3 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever it was to bring you back to middle school. Now imagine you've donned your nice footy pajamas, you're going to go to school dressed like Batman, or you're going to go to school probably not very dressed at all. Either way, when you show up, you may remember the day that you were told, and not very nicely, by your peers, that that was not the way you were supposed to show up to school. Now, think about what you did the next day. Now, mind you, there are people who are pretty hardcore, and will just get in your face and wear that one more day in a row, just to prove the point, but most people are going to pull back. They're going to use that as a template for what they think you believe they're supposed to be. So essentially, they're using their attacker as a template. Keep this in mind for what I'm going to tell you about this paradoxical circle. So we move on that both are a big important factor, and this paradoxical circle starts with the parent. Now just imagine we've got one parent her name is Vanessa. Vanessa has a child, Jason. Vanessa also, however, has an addiction. And whether Vanessa is actively engaged in this addiction or trying to remove herself from the addiction, it's obvious that she has no time for Jason. And what little time that she does have, statistics actually show that about 56% of children in domestic abuse cases in Billings, Montana alone are related to alcohol and drug abuse, which is a huge number. Now this leads to child maltreatment. The, in fact, it is the child maltreatment. The idea that he's being left behind by the parent or being actively abused by the parent. Jason's going to form a traumatic framework from which that person's going to build his personality. And like we said with the schoolyard institution, you see that he's going to emulate the person attacking him because the person attacking him is the person from which he's grabbing his template. And in this case, that person is his parent. And as we know, with the genetic influence, he already has a predisposition for this addiction. And now he's being trained environmentally by a person with said addiction. So he's going to start forming, Jason is going to start forming his own addiction. He's going to start forming his own personality traits that lead to that addiction. What we need to do is treat both people. So we're going to start the traditional treatment method. We're going to remove the mother from the situation. We're going to take her, we're going to start trying to better her life whilst simultaneously leaving Jason with a foster parent. Now what we're gonna do with Jason? It sure seems like I should be saying something right now, doesn't it? Well, we're not doing anything with Jason at this point. We're leaving Jason behind. So the solution, what can we do to break this paradox? I believe is family-centered therapy. 
Now, something that we need to understand about family-centered therapy is it's not the traditional Hollywood version of what family-centered therapy looks like. It used to be the idea that we'd get the mom, the dad, we'd get Jason in there, we'd get his siblings in there, grandparents if we could, to get to the root of the problem, to understand what was going on and try and build that family dynamic. Now, this worked. It was a great idea. But as you can imagine, we're talking about a highly trauma-induced situation. So it became very uncomfortable for the caseworkers and for the clinicians. So what did they have to do to kind of build off of this? What did they have to do to fix this? The traditional method was changed to this. It's based off of what is called an evidence-based practice. Now, what an evidence-based practice is is exactly what it sounds like. This is the idea that we're going to automate a system of therapy to the point that even if we need to change something, it's still manualized. And because of that, we can quantify what's actually being done by the therapy and actually understand where people are at in their process and how we're actually accomplishing something. So this actually shows that these programs really do help affect this problem. One of these programs is called Celebrating Families. Just as an example, this one is specifically geared toward domestic abuse, high-risk families. The idea is that you're going to pull your families apart into different groups, and you're going to have children arranged by age, you're going to have adults, you're going to have the grandparents in their own groups, and they're going to learn to deal with each other. The one thing that they never learned as a family, to speak with each other but not fight. And then when we finally get them together, that highly trauma-induced situation is not going to be nearly as volatile. So it allows us to have that better effect. Another such program is called Seeking Safety. Now what Seeking Safety is, is this is an interesting program for the sheer fact that we're taking the treatment and putting it into the client's hands. The idea that under a voluntary basis, this person can present themselves as the facilitator and help other people allows them to internalize the addiction treatment, allows them to treat themselves effectively, which is very helpful in situations like this. Now, I've gone across a couple points that somewhat seem relatively unrelated. The idea that clinicians are overtaxed, then also the fact that there's a paradoxical system that traps us inside of addiction. Now, I do believe, and I think that it's obvious, that programs like these can break that paradox. But what we haven't done is allowed for the clinician to actually individually tailor things and work with their clients. So what we have to do is add an evaluation division. Now, what the evaluation division is going to do is they're going to take a set of numbers just like this. Now, this number set seems incredibly random. If they're going to take that and they're going to turn it into something like this, what does that mean not only for the clinician but for the institution itself? What it means for the clinician is that they get a real-time idea of what the client is doing. Not only do they get a real-time idea of what the client is doing, but because it's manualized, it allows them the time to actually individually tailor that program as well. So that allows them time to work with and build off of their program and actually incorporate them in the research process, which is a really novel idea. Not only that, but for the more economically minded people in the room, we always have to prove to the insurance companies that our treatments are accomplishing something. And we always have to prove to the government that our treatments are accomplishing something. So even if you don't care about the client, which I know you do, we've still got the fact that this needs to be done just to forward our progress and the fact that money is part of what forwards our progress in this. So if we look at it, essentially what we have here is an axle without a wheel. And what we've done now is we've added the wheel with that family-centered therapy. However, we still lack the friction to move ourselves into the future and to move ourselves forward. So what we've done is we've added the rubber and the traction that allows that motor, that high torque factor, to move itself forward with the evaluation team. So in closing, I'd just like to say that the point is that we need to take and not only break the paradox, but we need to make sure that the next system doesn't trap itself in another circle. 
So I'd just like to say thank you to all the people who invited me here today, because this is a crazy great experience. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody sitting in front of me today as well, but not for listening to me, but for hopefully going out and disseminating this information to your peers. Not just my information, but all the information that you've heard. Even if that comes in the form of picking up your own trombone and sharing your soul that way. Take what you've heard here and change the future. That's what this is for. Thank you.